Yeah, we're back. We're live uh, on a given, what, Tuesday uh, morning. And this is Jay Fidel on ThinkTech, and we're doing Community Matters today with a kind of double whammy. We're going we're to meet uh, Miss Earth USA, Libby Hill. We're also going to talk about the most important story uh, until we got the coronavirus, the most important story, according to the journalism school at UH Manoa, which is climate change. Anyway, welcome to the show, Libby. So nice to see you. Thank you so much for having me today. First thing I want to do is introduce you, um, you know, on your campaign, your personal Earth campaign, let's call it. Um, how did you get involved in, you know, saving the planet? That's not an easy thing to do when you wake up in the morning, though. No. Right. Well, it is if you love it. Anything is. So my family's from Galveston, Texas. It's an island in on the Gulf Coast in Texas. So living right on the water out there, we are so connected to our environment. And that really inspired a passion for me for protecting the environment we live in. We witness every day the changes that happen, the wildlife that's present. So I felt very connected to it and I felt a responsibility to protect it. So that's how I got started with my commitment to environmentalism. Well, it's, you know, the burden of your generation to save the planet. Uh, that's right after we finish with this coronavirus thing, which I hope is very soon. Yes. So what, bring, what brings you to Hawaii? Are you here on a special trip? Does it have to do with being Miss uh, Earth USA? It does. I am here as Miss Earth, Miss Earth USA. I'm actually visiting some of the regional title holders. The Hawaii organization is based here, obviously. So I'm getting to spend some time with my sister queens locally. And we're going to be working on everything from restoration projects to preparing them for the national pageant and being out in nature and really just getting to learn more about the Hawaiian culture. Well, that's great. Well, tell us more about being Miss Earth USA. I mean, how did you get involved in it? Uh, and what is the mission? I, I assume it attracts you because you're on a personal Earth campaign, but I'd like to know more about how you spend your time as Miss Earth USA. Yes. So as Miss Earth USA, you wear a lot of hats and a crown, obviously. So I've been meaning to get one myself. Yeah. Well, yes, I wish you were here to try on this one. <laughs> <laughs> so as Miss Earth USA, it's my responsibility to advocate for my environment. My personal platform is coastal restoration. So Hawaii is a great place to visit on behalf of that cause. I also work a lot with educating my community, educating children in classroom settings and at events that are related to coastal restoration or sustainability. So educating and volunteering are two of my main responsibilities. And then also the goal of Miss Earth USA is to create more empowered women who are both successful in business and life and also they are strong advocates for the environment. So I work a lot in trying to build up other women and develop them into environmental advocates and boss ladies. Yeah, well, we love having you here because we, we believe in the environment. We also want to save the planet. And, and we really like talking to people who are advocating for that. It's, as I said, the most important story of our time. So are you the first Miss Earth USA or are you were one in a, in, a, in a string of them? And how long does your term last? I am one in a long stream. So our pageant has been around for decades and we are a international pageant. So Miss Earth USA actually goes to the international Miss Earth competition, which involves countries from all over the world. And the reign typically lasts a year. I was appointed Miss Earth USA heir uh, back in last summer and so i've actually had i assumed the title in november and i have about nine months in order to complete the goals that i have set for myself in my platform so why do i think that you must you must have a lot of traveling to do as miss earth because it's a big planet and and it's this is an international global office you hold it is, yes. I am doing my best to get around to all of the coasts in the United States. That was one of my goals. And so Hawaii is definitely part of that goal. I know right now everybody is very apprehensive about travel. I am as well. And so with respect to everyone in local communities and everyone in our nation going through what they are, I'm going to do my best to achieve that goal as long as it's safe still. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we talk about travel these days. Uh, never a day goes by these days uh, uh, without news about being, travel being held up or uh, banned by one government or another. Uh, how has that affected your 
your role as Miss, Miss Earth and your global travels? So definitely for the next few months, everything is up in the air. It's a little bit uncertain. We still intend to hold the pageant in July, but in between them, I'm going to be working in my local community as much as possible, respecting social distancing and respecting the health of my community. There's always a way to be more environmentally friendly, even if that happens in your own household. So that's making the choice to cook at home, to forego plastic in the household, single-use plastics, you know, even if we're on quarantine, you can still make better choices for the environment. Obviously, we're seeing a great impact with the reduction in travel and transport that is, in a way, healing to the earth. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from this situation and a lot that can still be done at home. Thank you for that. I think that's an important point. You know, uh, yes, we're all engaged. Uh, we're all completely uh, overtaken by coronavirus and the, and the, uh, tra uh, the, the pandemic. But at the same time, we cannot forget about the environment. Mm -hmm. We have to do and advocate for and work on both issues at, at the same time. We can do that. Yes, anyway, that was... so you have been, go ahead. I was just going to say that is one of the, the big reasons that I did still come to Hawaii. We are being very respectful. I'm just staying with my local queens and small groups, but the work still needs to be done. The planet needs healing as much as our society. And so that's why we're still on this mission and we're doing it respectfully and we're making some considerations, but the mission doesn't stop. Right, the show goes on. It's yes, very sir. important. And I'm, I'm really glad you said that. It's an important point in these times. So you've been to Australia, or at least you've been focusing on the fires in Australia. Can you talk about that? So I have not been to Australia personally, but I definitely did my part in attempting to advocate and support organizations that were registered and were healing the wildlife and trying to support the communities there. So it was a catastrophic event, but I was encouraged at how many people from all over the world took part. And it's a, there's a lot to be learned from what happened in Australia, the importance of our wildlife and our diversity the importance of maintaining our natural environment. And I hope that events like this don't happen in the future, but if they do, I, I also hope we'll be prepared for them because of this. Yeah, very tragic what has happened in mm -hmm. Australia and may happen again in Australia or, or uh, other places. And, and there's no question, is there no question at all, but the, uh, the increase, the exacerbation of the fires in Australia, uh, that's, that's a function of climate change, isn't it? Indeed, we are seeing a lot of climate change occurring just as a result of the natural emissions or the less than natural emissions, human emissions. They are contributing to an increase in greenhouse gases, which in turn heats up the planet. And when that happens, we do see shifts in weather patterns. We do see shifts in the extent of the, the climate events that occur, and it can be catastrophic. So. We've witnessed a lot of that in the past few years, increases in hurricanes and natural disasters and the fires in Australia being a very recent and obvious example. So I hope that quickly we will become more aware of that and we will reduce our emissions and do our own part in ensuring that those climate events are being mitigated. It's so important we do that. We have to do it now. It's an existential threat. Now, you, you have uh, participated in uh, the work on Hawaii Bill 40, which is the, the plastic ban here in Honolulu. Uh, can you talk about the bill and your, uh, your role in dealing with it? So I actually, I did not participate in that bill, but I am a huge proponent of it as I am an advocate for coastal health and for coastal restoration. And one of the big issues that I have seen across my travels and during my service work restoring the coastlands is the presence of plastic everywhere and it gets into our environment. And even if it's not a giant Coke can, when you get, or you know, a, a plastic Coke bottle, when you get into the ocean, you see these small pieces of plastic that have been beaten by the waves and it's really hard to extract that from our oceans. So recycling is not enough. The only thing that we can do is remove plastics from production and try and decrease the amount of plastic that's put out into the world. And so I think this ban was an incredible step to show the world that there is a different way to do things and we're going to figure it out together. Um, putting policy out there that supports environmental protection and that decreases plastics and decreases waste 
Hopefully this will set a great example for the rest of the country, and I hope to see far more legislature, even on a national le level, that contributes to this plastic ban. Yeah, no reason why we can't uh, do that. We should do that nationally. There's and always is, a better uh, way. There is. Yes, and, and Hawaii wants to be a leader in this, and I'm glad that they uh, passed Hawaii Bill 40. So now the big six, can you talk to me about the big six? What is that, and, and uh, how does it work in, in the context of this discussion? So uh, we're talking about the, the big six issues that are affecting our climate change, things like deforestation, rising temperatures, increased greenhouse, ga greenhouse gases, changing temperatures of the ocean. So all of these things are kind of puzzle pieces in the state of our planet as a whole. And the actions that affect them occur locally first. So the big things that we see contributing to all of these, and they're very intertwined, are things like carbon emissions, fossil fuel burning, the impact of transportation, and just waste and, and generally how we're living. So because we're burning fossil fuels at a greater rate because of the impact of agriculture and actually energy production is the highest, um, per, or it creates the highest amount of greenhouse gas emissions. All of these things are coming together to change the state of our climate and our planet. And they are these six areas where we can focus most on creating change. Well, we know, I mean, the charts and graphs show it very clearly that the earth is hotter and, and that the increase in temperature is uh, escalating. Um, and gee, that's, you know, that's, that's not a good, good news story. Um, but the big six, it sounds like if we can reduce the big six, then maybe we can reduce that temperature um, and reverse climate change. Is it, is it true? Tell me how it works. So it's, it's hopefully there is a way to reverse some of the climate change, but our goal at this point is really just to stop the progression at the rate that it's occurring. And mm -hmm. so if you are more respectful with your travel, um, if you're more respectful with, you know, simple things, carpooling, music, public transportation, they're things that everyone can take a part in. There are programs, um, when I use this, called Jet Set Offset. So if you are traveling on a plane for any reason, they will actually take a certain percentage of the miles that you have, or money for each mile that you've traveled. And what they do is create environmental projects that offset the impact of that travel. So there's always a way to start. Transportation is a really big one, but also just making better choices with your energy consumption at home. It's all the things you've always heard about. Turn off the lights when you leave the room. If you can, if it's possible, invest in energy efficient appliances. Um, not everyone is going to make change in the same way because we all have different economic circumstances. We all have different geographic circumstances. So figuring out what works best in your community is, is really the first step. And you are the authority in that. You know, a lot of people are home now, <clears throat> you know, they're worried about the coronavirus and, and they're following government suggestions or orders to stay home and uh, limit, you know, the spread of the virus. But that's one thing they can do, isn't it? While they're home, that's their homework, if you will, <laughs> to study this and figure out how to be, you know, more environmentally friendly. And yes. uh, maybe, maybe a, that's a way to deal with both issues at the same time, don't you think? We do. We have the time to study. We have the time to research and learn. And I encourage everyone to look at real data. Um, you know, don't go to somebody's blog and read about the environment that way. I encourage you to go to trusted websites, trusted organizations. Um, make sure that there's an insignia. Make sure that the government supports the research. That, you know, we need to educate ourselves, but we need to make sure that we're not consuming more fear or we're not consuming, you know, statements that are made by people who have alternate agendas. The, the only agenda here should be saving our planet and creating a better society. Right, what could be more important? We're gonna take a short break. That's Libby Hill, she's Miss Earth USA. We'll be right back and we'll talk about the teen movement. It's not just Libby Hill, it's a lot of other key people, including teens. We'll be right back.
Okay, we're back. We're live here in Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and we're talking about Community Matters, perhaps one of the most important Community Matters of all, and that is uh, climate change and protection of the environment and the and the planet Earth. And we have Libby Hill here with us. Uh, she is Miss Earth USA, which is um, a big title, but also a big burden and a big leadership role because there's a lot of people in her generation, and we look to them. Sorry to say, Libby, we look to them. We look to you to save us. So it's very important that you do what you do. It's very important that you come here and talk about it. So let's talk about the other people in the movement. Let's talk about the teens, the millennials, what have you, uh, who are with you and who you rub shoulders with. Now, you can't rub shoulders too much these days. But rub elbows. <laughs> rub elbows. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what, what is it like? What is that community like and how active are they? So we've actually seen a massive increase in the involvement of teens and young adults in the climate movement. I think it's become very apparent that this is our burden to shoulder if we want to create an environment that can sustain life for ourselves, for our future children, and for our future dreams that we need to take action. So I've seen a lot of teenagers, um, you know, it's been very popularized with people like Greta Thunberg who have made climate strike. I was strike. going to ask you about her. I was going to, have you met her? Oh, no, I have not. That would be a dream, though. I would love to it meet her and sit down with her. For all of us. Yeah, yes. yeah. Okay, sorry I interrupted. Go ahead. No worries. So as far as that movement goes, I am working to focus a lot of my education toward youth because I believe that sometimes it's hard to change people's minds if they're stuck in a certain way of thinking, if that's been reinforced, if they can't, conceptualize the problem, but the best thing we can do, and as parents, the best thing you can do for your children is to teach them about the importance of the environment and ways to live sustainably. Teach your children to recycle. Teach them to make better choices on the products that they use. Teach them to support B corporations and net zero corporations and give them the tools and the knowledge that they need to make that a lifestyle. So that's my hope for the future generations. And that's what you advocate for, isn't it? When you go out and you talk to people, you're trying to get at least uh, that, that group, the millennials, the teens, uh, to follow along in that idea. But is there an organization? Uh, is it limited to Miss Earth USA? What I would like, you know, I'm frankly, I don't think there is, but uh, is there an organization where these, these kids and young people are coming together so that they can advocate with you, uh, where they can get together and have an effect politically? Um, and uh, you know, spread the good word. So I think there are many organizations and a lot of it depends on your cause. Um, some that I support, the National uh, Resources Defense Council, they are constantly pushing legislation. They are constantly making um, the community aware of legislation that can be supported and that benefits our society and our environment. Um, there are, you know, organizations like Surfrider who also work in the coastal regions that are pushing legislature. And so depending on what your cause is, there is always somewhere to go. Social media obviously is very popular with this generation and it can be used as a great tool for informing yourself. So if you start finding organizations that line up with the portions of environmentalism that you're passionate about with sustainability, that is a great way to come together and use your own voice to speak on behalf of those organizations as well. You know, we started out talking about how this was your, you know, personal Earth campaign, and I, and I, and I understand from the discussion that uh, it's not just limited to your year in service here as uh, Miss Earth USA. It'll continue after that. So, how will it continue after that? What are your plans to continue the mission after your term of office? Yes. So I, I love this question because I think it's really important to note that my my project coming into Miss Earth USA was coastal restoration. As you know, living with my family in Galveston and being witness to that environment, I became really passionate about that. I'm actually attending school in Austin, Texas right now, so there's not a lot of coastline for me to work with there. But I'm studying to be a registered dietitian. And food is one of the food systems in our country are a huge source of greenhouse gas emissions, of you know carbon emissions with transportation, production, and food waste. And so as I am kind of moving environments myself, the way that I intend to impact the world is evolving. And so in my practice as a dietitian, I hope to offer sustainable solutions and 
educate people about food waste, about eating for the planet, because the things that are healthy for your body are surprisingly also very healthy for the planet. So I think that's a movement that is next on my list of things to do. We'll be here for you, Libby. Thanks. What I mean is, uh, you know, <clears throat> when you go back uh, to the mainland, uh, wherever you go and you want to do uh, advocacy uh, on these issues, uh, we can always join up with you remotely and have you on our shows and you can tell us how you're doing and what projects you're working on. I'd like to do that going forward. Make a mental note, okay? Yes. We're, we're always going to be behind you in this effort. So let's talk about the uh, New Green Deal. Uh, when uh, AOC, uh, you know, got into Congress and, um, gee, I mean, I, I guess uh, I guess Bernie uh, Sanders is on it and uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, has been on it and, and other people in Congress have been on it. I'm not sure it's going to make any traction right away, but can you tell us about, you know, how it works um, and when and to what extent you think it will be adopted? Yeah, so the Green Deal is really focusing on attempting to create less waste or less energy consumption. We're trying to go completely energy sustainable um, and reduce emissions based on transportation. That's a big way that they're focusing. So I'm not entirely sure if it's going to pass, but whether or not it does, it is a really important bill in my eyes because it, it tells us that environmental planning is something that you should consider when you're voting for a candidate and with the upcoming election, you need to make sure that your candidate has an environmental plan that aligns with your beliefs. And that's one of the big things that I'd like to just note on this, whether or not it passes, it's showing us that there is a need, it's communicating that to the public and it's communicating the need for environmental policy as you know a big factor in who we're electing as our president. So yeah, I would encourage everyone to do that research for themselves and, sure. and see where it's they lie. Be part of American politics going forward is going to be part of your generation, and you can never forget it. None of us can ever forget it. Mm -hmm. It's existential. So let's talk about uh, marine conservation, um, because, you know, Hawaii in the middle of the ocean, Hawaii has the reefs and the reef problem, <coughs> and Hawaii can see and through its science here, <coughs> through the University of Hawaii, mm -hmm. the degradation of the ocean uh, and the plastics problem you mentioned, but also at the biochemical level, we can see the ocean degrading. Yeah. Uh, what what is what is that what does that play in your role uh, on on saving the earth? So as I said, I've done a lot of work in Galveston, which is my home, my family's home, and there I was focused on actually restoring the shorelines, planting marsh grasses to protect against erosion, um, making sure that the oyster populations were out there in full force. They weren't being removed from the ocean without being replenished. And that helps with water quality. So all of these things in our local environment that we're really seeing the impact in our local environments, that occurs based on how we're treating our planet, how we're treating our world. So I know we keep coming back to those emissions, but the more carbon that we put out into the environment through the burning of fossil fuels and the use of energy, that goes into the environment. And when we suffer things like deforestation that have been so obvious with um, things like the Australia brush fires recently, we all think of trees as being the thing that absorbs the carbon dioxide and, and saves the planet that way and produce oxygen. But the ocean is actually also a reservoir for carbon. So when there aren't enough trees in the world to absorb all that carbon, the ocean takes a big, a, you know, a, a big portion of that carbon and it actually changes the composition of the ocean. It acidifies the ocean, which makes it far more hostile to certain types of marine life. Um, we've seen this in our coral reefs, uh, coral reef bleaching. All of these things are a result of the emissions that we are taking place in worldwide. So even if you live in a landlocked place, your actions impact our ocean. And the ocean is one of the most undiscovered places. There is so much biodiversity and many people are reliant on it for, I, I'm sure you're aware of this in Hawaii, many people are reliant on it for their jobs, to support their families. It's their local environment. It's, you know, how they keep their children safe. It's how they entertain themselves. And so it's a resource we have to protect. Is this something you studied in school too? Uh, have, have you taken courses? Would you take courses? Will you take a super duper PhD in this area? What? So I actually, I have a degree in human biology, which did expose me to a bit of environmental biology as well. But I am by no means, you know, incredibly educated through academic means. I'm only educated 
through my own research. Um, I do read a lot of peer-reviewed scientific articles on the subjects, and I do my best to stay truly informed, but you don't need to go to school for this to take part in it and to be knowledgeable about it. And so I would I would love for everyone to get out there and do their own research because I think that's a, a big thing. If you don't realize there's a problem, um, if you don't have an understanding of why things are occurring the way they are, it's really hard to get motivated to fix it. So I, I would encourage you to build your own education. Yeah, touche. And that's so for all of us. We, we're all you know inhabitants of the planet. We're all responsible for the planet. Mm -hmm. And we're all responsible to know about how it works. Um, I, and touche on that. I think it's very important for all of us to do that. And, and it's not just that you take a course. It's not just that you learn one issue. It's you dedicate your life um, to finding out about the planet and saving the planet. All of us, every single one. And so let's talk about I... the pageant. Yeah, oh, okay. I just wanted to make one quick note that I think that the people who are most informed and most able to make the changes and see the changes that need to be made are the people working in whatever industry they are. So, um, you know, me realizing that there's room in food service and in dietetics to make changes that could really impact the world, that's not something that an environmental study would maybe necessarily target. So there's always room in your own career for it. So I encourage everyone to look into that and see if there's a way to do things better. Yeah. There's always room for science, you know. Think Tech mm -hmm. was built around that idea. We all have to know about science, and we live in a world of science, and science can help us, but only if we learn about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I want to talk about the pageant. You know, um, how, how did that work? Uh, did you apply? Uh, other people apply? What was the competition like, and how did this differ from the other pageants we've heard about? Yes, yeah, so we are a national pageant, and we have delegates come from all of the states and regions across the United States. So it was a very competitive group. We had, I believe, over 60 girls competing for the national title, and they all had their own platforms and their own causes in the environment. But the thing that's so different about Miss Earth USA is that our mission is building advocates. We are judged on not only our presence on stage, we're also judged on how much we've committed to our environmental activities prior to ever showing up and also to our social media, how we're communicating and educating others. So uh, in ways, it's very similar to other pageants, but at the same time, we have a very specific focus, and that's why it's my system, and I love it so much. How has it changed you, uh, Libby Hill? How has it changed to be Miss Earth USA? I, I continue to learn, and I continue to do better. I, I think that the biggest thing that surprised me is as soon as I had this title on my head, I already thought I lived very environmentally friendly. And at the end of the day, there's always more to be done. And when you make it known that you're interested in the environment and you're interested in sustainability, people bring you solutions. And so that's been one of my favorite parts is making those connections and really teaching myself through this process as much as I teach others. Well, you're certainly not shy now. <laughs> and you're very eloquent about this, and you've learned you you know you've learned about it for sure. You're an expert and you're an advocate. I really appreciate that. My last question, which I would like you to discuss while you're here in Hawaii, is what about Hawaii? Hawaii has a lot of young girls who are interested in this, uh, millennials, teenagers, all that. Um, would you urge them to to uh, apply for your job, to be involved in the next pageant, uh, and how can they prepare? How can they? Uh, sort of um, get ready for it. Can you talk about that? I certainly would encourage anyone, even if you're not in Hawaii, anyone anywhere in the United States, definitely look into the Miss Earth pageant. Even if you don't think pageants are for you, there is something for everyone in a pageant. You are forced to examine your own opinions. You're forced to really be the best version of yourself and believe in yourself because you can't win and you can't push your cause if you don't have full belief in yourself and in your platform. So the biggest thing I could say is find something you're passionate about that will lead you through this experience so that even if you don't win the title, you know, one girl wins out of the 60 girls who are there, 60 plus girls who are there, but everybody has the opportunity to learn about themselves, to do better for the environment, and hopefully to create that ripple effect in their local communities and friend groups to show that, you know, you don't have to be what people think of an environmentalist. You can look like a beauty queen. You can look like whoever you want to be and still care for the world. So I would say... Yeah. Sign up, do your research, find something you care about, and focus on that. 
Yeah, that's leadership. So it's Miss Earth USA, what, dot com. And they can uh, find out more about it, maybe even uh, leave a note for you. And uh, you can consult with them and help them I in many that. ways. Yes, Let I'm always know. open to talking to anyone. So please reach out. I'm very friendly. Also through Miss Earth USA. Um, it's our handle on Instagram and, and Facebook. Thank you, Libby Hill. Miss Earth USA, thank yeah. you for joining us today. Thank you Aloha. so much for having me. Aloha. Thank you.